Okay, so we're on. Uh, my name's Darren. I am the founder and owner of Zulu Alpha Strap Company. Um, essentially, over the last five or so years, I've had the privilege of working in and understanding uh, the watch industry. Um, how that came about, how that started. Uh, it was a hobby. Uh, I, 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 I fell into this trap like so many of us did, um, just just through the passion of it. I bought myself a, a Breitling. Uh, I wanted a strap. I didn't want to spend the Breitling strap money, so essentially I made one. Uh, a bunch of people saw that and, and decided they wanted some of that action too. DMs, Etsy stores, WordPress, it evolved organically uh, and has done over the last four or five years. What I want to do with this series of conversations is basically start peeling back some of the layers of the industry. Uh, not necessarily pulling on uh, reviews or opinions. Uh, I want to come at it slightly different and try and understand uh, the motives and the drivers for the people involved uh, in making these pieces that we all uh, know and love. So that's what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, why are we doing it? Essentially, basically, because I don't think anyone else is doing it. And, and one of the most interesting aspects of what's going on in my life is the day-to-day -day running of things. Um, and I find that fascinating. And over the last four or five years, I've had the privilege of seeing how other companies are going through this process. And how other guys are experiencing uh, the industry, as it were, from a business standpoint. Um, and I think you guys would really enjoy it. I, I think it's 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 an insightful thing. I mean, ultimately, watches make no sense. Um, it's 2023, having cogs and gears on our wrist when we all carry a phone in our pockets, which is connected to satellites, um, makes zero sense at all. But we're here for a reason because we emotionally invest in what we do. Uh, we emotionally invest in brands. We emotionally invest in products. Um, it's the journey, it's the story that these pieces take us on. Um, understanding how the sausage is made is probably going to be quite an interesting aspect uh, to learn and to, you know, an interesting journey, should I say, uh, to go on um, and understand why these brands do what they do, how they do it, what the drivers are behind it what the constraints are within the manufacturing process, how they come up with the designs and ideas that they do. So essentially what we're going to be doing uh, over the next few episodes uh, is, is a bit of a deep dive uh, and a conversation with the brands, but also some of the interesting people in the space. Um, luckily I've managed to develop a, a bit of a black book of contacts uh, over the last four or five years, because this has become my profession. Uh, so I'm going to, dig into that uh, and try and bring some interesting conversations your way. So for those of you who don't know me, that's a bit of a, a an overcap. I give you just a few minutes ago on who I am, what I'm about, but it would be unfair for me to ask people to tell their story if I'm not willing to tell mine. So I think what we need to do here initially on this first episode is take you guys on a bit of a path and a bit of a journey on, on ZA and how ZA came about and on my background. So for me, I grew up in South Wales. Um, fairly modest upbringing. Uh, I grew up in a what was essentially a two up, two down. What that means for those of you not in the UK is two rooms upstairs and two rooms downstairs. Quite a common, uh, normal environment uh, for the working class people or the blue collar guy, uh, type of guys in the UK. Um, and, you know, I had a belly full of food and a heart full of love, but you know, we didn't have everything known to man. That's just the way it was. Um, did I have a good childhood? Yeah, it was awesome. I absolutely, you know, ha had the best that I, I could possibly have from a family. And that ultimately ended up in me joining, joining the Navy. Why did that happen? Well, my old man was at sea for 24 years. His dad was at sea. He actually died at sea, uh, as was his father and his father. So I think, so the legend goes, I think I'm like a fifth generation mariner. Ultimately, uh, I joined up. Uh, straight out of school, um, went off, had short hair, shiny shoes, and they sent me to sea. Um, I ticked all the boxes I wanted to tick, um, and I decided it was time for me probably to transition out of that environment, um, as one of the aspirations I had was also um, getting involved in business, but also starting a family. And for me, it wasn't uh, the perfect environment to to start a family and, and raise kids. Um, I, I get for a bunch of you guys, you, you've gone through that, and I take my hat off to you. Um, it's just not something I don't think I could have coped with. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's horses for courses, as they say. So I came out of the military, 
my background uh, in an avian, what I was doing there was uh, information systems and tech. Um, so I ended up in the tech space. For a long time, I worked for a, a fairly large Japanese IT company, uh, and that accumulated in me running um, the north of the UK, basically, uh, for this business on their sales teams. Um, that was coaching and developing uh, members of staff, running offices, service teams, uh, handling contracts, winning contracts, uh, that type of stuff. And, and, and that unknowingly set me up in a really good way um, with ZA. Uh, ZA was a hobby. Um, watches has always been a hobby before I got into the business side of stuff. It was very much a, a hobby and a passion that I enjoyed and I enjoyed massively. Um, and I got to a point where I bought myself a Breitling and uh, I wanted a replacement strap. The reason I wanted that is because I couldn't afford a new Breitling, so I bought a pre-owned one. It had a rubber strap on it uh, that was already starting to perish. Um, I was heading into the city of London one day and Basically, I stunk. Um, I was in the t on the tube uh, holding on to one of the handrails and, and, and all I could smell was this funk coming off my wrist because it was roasting outside. Um, and it legitimately smelled like a belly button, um, which kind of <laughs> kind of knocked me sick. Um, so I thought, right, we, we've got to explore some, some other options here around um, straps. Uh, initially, I went to the Breitling website and when I have a look what what those guys were offering, um, nothing really tickled my fancy uh, and the stuff they had was massively out of my budget at the time. Um, but I'd heard a story of a bunch of French guys who'd made straps out of parachute web and I thought, well, how, how difficult can this be? Um, quite arrogantly, how difficult can this be? I fucking learned the hard way how difficult that is. Um, but yeah, how difficult can this be? So I started looking at things I had left over from from my time in the military, uh, went for small kit bags, stumbled across a rifle sling in my garage uh, for the SA-80. The Breitling I had at the time was the Super Ocean Heritage. Uh, it was the Mark One, and they had 24 mil lugs on them. Um, just so happens, British issue rifle string, uh, rifle sling is around about 24 mil uh, itself. So it was like a match made in heaven. Um, I managed to get this sling, threw it through a sewing machine really crudely, come up with a buckle design. Uh, I'm kind of condensing this story there a little bit, but it, it, it took quite a while to, to ultimately come up with what we have now is the ZA strap. Um, but when it got to a point where I could wear it, I wore it, a bunch of people saw it, and it started off on forums. I think it was the TZ UK forum. Um, one of the guys who was working in the same company at the time, his brother was a bit of a, a big hit and still is on that forum. Um, he would saw a picture of the strap through his brother um, and, and asked me to make him one. So I did. I sent it over. He got it. And one or two images went on the forum. And the next thing I started getting emails off people asking me to make straps for him. That grew and developed into an Etsy store, um, which is quite interesting, really. It's a weird thing, Etsy. It's the type of stuff, certainly in the UK, where your nan would sell her knitting. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 a, it's a weird sort of wonderful maker's place where people can go if they haven't got the infrastructure in place or don't really understand the, the, the online e-commerce marketplace um, to, to sell their wares and, and sell things that are honest, homemade, handmade, that, that, that type of thing. And it worked really well for us for a period of time. Um, but the fees were just ridiculous. We were selling, or I was selling at the time, you know, the odd strap here and there. And I think Etsy was taking on about 25% of what we were making just just in their fees, that coupled with PayPal payments and stuff, it, 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 the juice almost wasn't worth the squeeze. I say that we were only doing a couple of week at the time. Um, again, I've said we, it was me. Um, this was just beer money. That's all it was. It wasn't meant to be anything. Um, it, it just got weird and interesting. And that journey sort of grew legs and, and, and took me with it. Um, I, I very much feel like a spectator in a lot of this. Um, which is weird, but it is what it is. So the Etsy store was a thing that grew and developed and, and so did the demand um, uh, into what would be our first website, which was a WordPress website. Um, I had no business building a website, but I had no money either. So I tried to figure that one out on my own um, and it went pretty good. Um, we got to a point essentially where we were having drops and releases 
and you guys had turned up and we'd end up 404 in the website because there was too much demand. I got to that stage, I developed some strong relationships with guys in the industry by that point. And I was advised to get onto the Shopify platform, um, which I did. And that's grown and developed from going from the, the basic Shopify platform to now the, you know, the, the Shopify Plus uh, system that we use at the minute. And that is a really condensed version of, of the journey. Along that path, we've had the, the, the privilege of working with brands like uh, Vertex, like Sangin, like Elliot Brown, uh, like Christopher Ward, um, some, some fairly sizable companies in the mix there. Um, and our team has grown from me uh, to now four of us uh, full time uh, and a few other people uh, we either contract work out to um, or do bits for us uh, on like a retainer base. So essentially that's a bit of an insight and an overview into ZA, into me, uh, into what I'm trying to achieve with this. Um, I want to give you guys something that's different. The whole watch scene and the watch podcast stuff is based around opinion and review. And I enjoy that. I'm a listener. Um, I listen to a bunch of podcasts and I enjoy it, but very few people uh, in a situation or in a position where they can peel some layers back and give you guys a bit of an insight into how this thing works. Um, and it's very different. It's very, very different. Um, I've learned that over the years that when you come into something like this and it's a hobby or you've got a passion and it's a, it's a space and an environment where you're really emotionally invested in, um, how different that becomes when you sh start to work in that place and it becomes how you pay your mortgage. It becomes how you feed your kids. It becomes, you know, everything. Um, Cause ultimately it does. When we build brands or businesses, vast majority of people doing it, have never done it before, or they're trying to figure it out as they go. And, and the emotional investment from that and the level of risk and the chance and the, the vast majority of the story, people never ever get to hear. Um, they'll never understand it because it's never spoken about. And that to me is the most interesting side of how this works, is the risk that people take, is the the rolling the dice, the fuck, you know, what have we done here? I'm all in at this point. If this doesn't come off, then I'm back to square one. Or if this does come off, we're, we're, we're leveling up as a business. That's the side of stuff I wanna delve into on this. Luckily, um, it's not just going to be the business stuff for you. Otherwise this would be a business podcast. That's not, that's not the idea of it. I wanna bring you guys interest in people that I've had the pleasure and the privilege of getting to know along the journey. Um, that will be in some instances, business owners, that will be in some instances, people who work with or for brands. Uh, and that will be in some instances, just fucking interesting people uh, who loosely fit in the watch community somehow. So that's basically the overview. That's what we're trying to achieve. Um, that's kind of the formal bit out of the way. Uh, it's a bit, bit of a bit of an odd situation today. I had um, a phone call off, um, off a buddy last week uh, who's been threatening to come up to Liverpool for best part of two years now. Um, and he's finally pulled his finger out and arrived this morning at, what time was it, Rob? You rocked up to Liverpool? About quarter to ten. About quarter to ten. And the time now is 11.20. Um, we've been in the studio since around about 10.30 this morning. Um, so it was an open invitation. Uh, Rob was up. Our plan is to drink lots of pints uh, and put the world to rights this afternoon. Um, also, you know, Swan or, or Squire Rob about the workshop for a little bit. Um, I'll show him the dark arts and black magic of uh, of ZA. Um, for those of you who don't know who I'm talking about or who I'm referencing, your handle on Instagram, Rob, is... RW underscore M100. RW underscore M100. Now you know what I'm talking about. You've seen his fucking pictures and they're awesome. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, ultimately, Rob, talk to me, mate. Talk to me. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm uh, a bit of a rabbit in headlights right now. Um, obviously, yeah. I was only coming up for a few beers and a chat. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm sat in front of a mic. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it, 
Pleasure to be here, mate. Yeah, mate, it's awesome. Um, yeah, ultimately it was that. It was it was a, it was a few beers and a chat, but being out here in town, mate, and I'm rocking I'm rocking down here anyway doing this. Um, why not fucking bring you on? Um, we've been friends for a long time. You've supported and been part of the ZA family for a long time. Um, and mate, I'm just I'm I'm fucking thrilled that, that you're up here, mate. And I hope we brought your stab vest with you. Um, <laughs> It's a little different up here, mate. The down south, where you're from. Well, yeah. well you, you you knock around, but you're you're a northerner originally, anyway, aren't you? Yeah, I was uh, born and raised in Rotherham. Ooh. Uh, left home at 19 to join the same group of people that you joined. Ah, old chips, old chips. Yeah, yeah. Tell us that story, mate. Um, yeah. Um, after I finished college, didn't really know what I wanted to do with life. Um, so I ended up joining joining the navy. Um, joined up in 2004, same year as you, I believe. Yeah, I think we were a few months apart, I think, in basic. Yeah. Um, did, obviously, rally, um, then moved on to Collingwood, um, did, like, weapons training and all that kind of stuff down there, and then went to sea for the first time, um, wanted a little bit more. So I put in for a... I initially asked to do, do the All Arms Commando course, um, got refused by my captain at the time hmm. um, because there was a shortage in my branch or something stupid like that. What, what branch were you, mate? Warfare. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, which then ironically turned into seaman specialist, didn't it? Oh, <laughs> we'll not go there. Those of you who know what that is, you'll know. There's a lot of eyebrows that just raised there for the speakers. I can hear them. Um, but yeah, seaman specs, mate, that, that, that. Yeah, that's that's a whole podcast on its own. But but carry on, go on. Uh, so yeah, put in for an all arms commando course, got denied. At that point, I was threaders, absolutely threaders, and um, I was on the verge of throwing my chit in. Um, instead, I put in for a transfer to Royal Marines, um, which ironically should never have got approved because I was on a career check at the time. Ooh. Naughty boy. <laughs> um, so is that I, a story we can go into? Probably, probably not. not. <laughs> probably not. Yeah, we we'll leave that one alone. We we'll leave that one alone. I should have known better than to ask that. Um, so yeah, I was on a career check at the time, so I should never have been approved for the for the transfer. But thankfully, my captain that actually denied me the all arms commando course could see that I was pretty passionate about doing something more, and he actually approved the transfer. Um, so I went shoreside for a bit until all the transfer paperwork was signed, sealed and delivered. And then, yeah, I left the Navy one day uh, on like the Monday or Friday, whatever it was. And then, yeah, I had one day of being a civvy and then I rejoined the, uh, the Marines, got on a train, obviously went down to Limston, Limston, yeah. walked through those gates and, mm. uh, I've, I've never been the same since. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a changed man. Um, did obviously um, did the Marines, um, and much like yourself, um, met my now wife, mm. um, and we were talking about settling down, buying a house together. Obviously, wanting a wanting a family, and the military life isn't conducive to a stable family life. Um, so. It's at that point that I threw my chit in, did my years, uh, no, disregard. I did about two months notice because the uh, defence cuts were kicking in. Ooh, did um, you manage to get the payout? Yeah. Oh, so poetry. Got got um, a payout, obviously only did two months um, yeah, notice yeah. period and I was out the door. Um, and then, yeah, settled down with my now wife, um, obviously... obviously bought a house family family and yeah the rest is kind of history mate absolutely so what are you doing now I this is really weird as well because I know exactly what he's doing now but you guys don't so <laughs> tell us mate I work at an airport as a firefighter okay well not strictly true um, I'm what they call a senior airport fire officer so I'm actually in charge of the fire department at said airport um, on a pretty face mate aren't you huh? <laughs> I started there a few months after I left the marines yeah. um, 
because I had zero transferable skills, like nothing transferred. Okay. I was handy with a rifle and that was about it, um, which in civilian life means uh, nothing. In the UK, it means nothing. There's not a lot you can do with it. But I suppose the firefighting element is kind of interesting because I've had this conversation um, before with people. When you're at sea and when you're on a ship, um, imagine it's a fire. Who do you call? You've got, you know, there's no fire brigade. There's no one coming to help you. So what you find is the vast majority of sailors in any Navy in the world are trained up to a certain standard in firefighting anyway. That, uh, that was it. That was my only transferable skill. So because obviously been to sea, I've done a BISC, I've done an ISC, which of course. is a basic sea survival course or an intermediate sea survival course. Um, so that was my only transferable skill. So this job came up as a firefighter. I applied, well, actually my missus applied for it for me. Yeah. Um, Went for the, went um, went for the interview. Um, the guy that was interviewing me had a real hard on for like ex military okay. people. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So I was pretty much a shoo-in for the job. Um, got the job, um, and I've been there ever since. Um, approaching my fourteenth year there. Wow, wow! Um, you just love fucking pain and misery, don't you? Running around with centre feds <laughs> and feet and all, and fucking sweating your bollocks off. That's. Uh, yeah, mate, 14 years, cracking that. I mean, you managed to get some gleaming pictures, mate, of um, aircraft and, and, and airfields and stuff. So I, naturally using the backdrop at work to achieve that. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So how, just... how did you get into the watch stuff, mate? How did that come about? Um, Always been into watches a bit like yourself. Um, Obviously I had, joining up, you get told to turn up with one. And then obviously from there, but I mean, even as a kid, I, I always liked watches. Um, and, oh God, how, what, four, four, five years ago now, I just got fed up with the smartwatch world and constantly having to charge it, constantly be notified that you've got some stupid message on. Yeah, your Auntie Tracy's fucking like your picture on Facebook. Yeah, yeah not that I'm on Facebook. Um, very few of us are, mate. Didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I started looking into getting myself a decent watch. Um, obviously went down the the usual high street channels and, and all that kind of stuff and couldn't find anything that really floated my boat. Um, obviously being ex-military, I started researching military watches and things like that and stumbled across um, Vertex. Approached Vertex, which at the time was just Don on his own. Yeah. Um, approached Vertex, Don, and um, asked to buy an M100. At the time, the M100 was reserved for anybody that's either serving or um, a veteran. And he was kind enough to extend me an invitation to buy one. So I thought, right, that's it. Um, didn't really have the money to buy it. Um, but I, I put myself in a position where I, I, I felt I, I kind of had to. So pulled the trigger, bought my M100, and that's kind of how the whole into this whole watch world started. It's a slippery slope, mate. It's like uh, it's like a drug habit. That's exactly <laughs> what it's like. It's weird. Um, um, yeah, and then obviously I initially I got I got this watch and I I was blown away by it. Uh, mm. It was just, wow, such a great watch. And so I started taking a few photos of it. I've got a bit of a background in photography. My dad used to be like a semi-professional photographer, so he kind of taught me the ins and outs of mm. um, how you take a decent photo and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I started taking a few photos of this watch. Um, they were pretty pretty rubbish to start with um, because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, but I started, I was like, oh, I'm taking these photos. I need to share them. So I started putting them onto my own Instagram page. And then I used to get a lot of my friends saying, what the hell are you What you sharing a photo of a watch for? And I was like, oh, yeah, this is obviously not wrong crowd. So then I set up a, a separate Instagram account that would literally just be for photos of this watch. And one thing just led to another. And before you know it, it all kind of started spiraling. Um, and yeah. It's a slippery slope, man. That happens fast. I mean, there's a few bits I want to dip into, you know, on what you just said. But first and foremost, shout out to Don from Vertex. Um, 
I spoke to Don last week and told him this was becoming a thing. Um, and I think we've managed to convince him to get his ass up north um, and sit down in the chair where you're in now and have that conversation. Uh, but for those of you that don't know, Vertex is a company based in the UK who make watches. They had the, or oh, they were formed part of the Dirty Dozen during World War II. An iconic set of watches, 12 watches where the MOD commissioned a specific design to be made uh, for the guys who were fighting in the war. Um, Vertex was one of the, I think the only British supplier on that list of 12. Um, and Don's great grandfather, yeah. Claude Lyons, I that's believe. The one, that's the one. Um, he he owned the company at the time. Uh, fast forward to now, Don's running it, and he decided with the M100. For those of you who are unfamiliar of it, um, it's a modernization or a retake on what was the Caliber Fifty Nine, uh, which formed part of that dirty dozen. Uh, Don runs a company now. Awesome guy, absolutely fucking awesome guy. Um, I, I can't speak highly enough of him and everyone I meet who, who, who's met him uh, is the same. Um, hopefully you guys get to know a bit better on, uh, on one of the episodes we've got coming up, but what, what a guy and I just want to give some, uh, some credit to him there um, for you know, facilitating you into this space, mate. Um, yeah, I'll second that. Don has been nothing but a gentleman throughout my time of knowing him um from the moment that you sold me this watch to to now um I, I don't know if i should really tell this part of my story it's down to you mate um so if you if you know me um i i obviously take watch photos um and a few years ago don approached me and asked if i wouldn't mind looking after the vertex instagram page um, that's the fucking cat out of the bag. <laughs> it's the cat out of the bag. Fucking hell, now we know. Um, so, uh, yeah, Don has been nothing but kind and generous to me and, and supported me in this whole watch hobby. And I feel very honoured to be a friend of his and obviously effectively work for him as well. Um, That's awesome, mate. And just just to clarify his stuff as well, guys, this isn't like a sponsored show. You know, Don's not paying us to <laughs> blow smoke up his hoop here. Um, this is just what you get for being a fucking good egg. Um, people people speak highly of you. Um, so yeah, uh, mate, he's he's awesome. He's yeah. fucking awesome. Yeah. We, we both had multiple interactions with him uh, over four or five years. I can't speak highly enough for the guy um, and I wish him every fucking success in the world. And I can't wait and I hope... Um, that I managed to uh, drag him up, yeah. up to the the true north, and uh, and get him in that chair, mate. So we can have a chinwag. But vertex for you, then, mate, is again. We talked. I talked about it earlier when I was babbling on by myself. It's an emotional investment. It becomes something that you you buy into with your heart. Yeah, massively. Yeah, like that M100 is going to live with me until. Till I pop my clogs and then it's going to go to, go to my son. Yeah. Um, and it's that relationship with the watch, the brand, and yeah, ultimately what, when I first bought it, it was the interaction with Don himself. Um, the customer service was unbelievable. Um, and just that personal touch that you get, like when you buy another kind of watch, if, if you bought a, a, a Rolex, for instance, you, 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 you've got no brand yeah. interaction yeah, yeah. whatsoever. You're just buying it. It's a possession. Whereas when you buy a watch from Don, you, you, you get that personal touch and, and you, you can literally reach out to him at any point and ask him a question. And he'll come pretty much straight back to you and, yeah. and, and answer it. Um, and yeah, he's, he's, he's been great. And then off the, off the back of that, obviously started taking some photos and started to get a little bit better and now yeah and now you know i'm far too humble to blow my own horn but i'll fucking blow it for you mate some of the best fucking farts in the world um you've managed to build your own following mate um around your watch photography and around the images and the style of images you capture some of them are just fucking crazy i have no idea how you do it um even 
though you give me a peek behind the curtain quite literally sometimes uh, on how things are done um, how you manage to capture some of these images is just fucking insane um, and it's not just me that thinks that and Don uh, it's a bunch of other guys uh, in the game who uh, also you know look to you and, and your creativity to sometimes to try and emulate sometimes to take inspiration from um, and it's a sub community within a sub community within a sub community. This is where it gets interesting. If you're into watches on a whole, you're a watch guy. Okay, great. Then you move a little bit and, and you could be into vintage pieces. You could be into the military stuff. Um, then within that, you'll have these subsects even again, you know, who are more of the utilitarian sort of crowd and, and, and they want images of, them fucking smashing it off hatches at sea or jumping out of aeroplanes in. Then you have the photography guys uh, like you and a few others yeah. who just literally bounce off each other to make fucking more and more impressive images every time. Um, and it's awesome to see. It's awesome to see. But that's, that's, that's the nitty gritty of stuff. I mean, you get into, you start peeling these layers away. And the sub-communities within the sub-communities within the yeah. sub-communities. Very much like a mob, mate. Do you know what I mean? The White Mafia or the submarine service or... That's, and again, that's kind of how I met you. Yeah. Because I, I, I wanted a strap that would literally, of my with my job, obviously, I can't afford to lose a watch. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And I needed something, I needed something secure, something that wouldn't break. And obviously, um, another nice side of your original Zulu Alpha strap was that it was infinitely adjustable. Yes. Um, and I've got little girl, girly wrists. No, you are. <laughs> no, you are. You're just fun size. Um, <laughs> so I couldn't, uh, like, you, you buy a normal strap and it's like one hole's too big, one hole's too small, yeah. all that kind of stuff. Whereas your original stuff was spot on um, and still is. Um, so I obviously bought a few of your straps. Yeah. Um, they were a little long, so I asked you to adjust them, and you did. Yeah. Um, and then um, from there, obviously, with my watch photography side of life, started taking a few photos, including your straps, and that's kind of how we got to know each other. Absolutely, this level. absolutely. And that, 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 you know, ultimately, mate, we're on a s similar timeline. Um, ZA really became a thing in about 2019. Prior to that, it was hobbies. Um, it was a hobby business. I do bits and bobs, but it became a company in 2019. And we were entering the space kind of at the same time as you were. Yeah. And as we progressed through that website cycle and we were refining what we were doing and trying to present a better image online, um, your skills were coming up and going through the roof. We become friends. Um, because of the interactions we'd had. And ultimately, mate, we got to a position where I think you were hitting every drop anyway. So I think I suggested to you, Rob, I'll tell you what, mate, we'll just stop, stop fucking buying stuff. Do me a favor. I'll send it down to you a few weeks before we put it live. Um, take me a picture for the website. Um, so we actually look like a legitimate company rather than me taking pictures of my fucking kitchen counter. Um, and you get to keep what I send you down. And ultimately, that's where it started for us. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and since then... Very you, organic, wasn't it? it? It was just honest, mate. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was just honest. You you, you got your fix, as it were. Yeah. Um, I got um, I got to look like actually like a fucking grown-up, um, which was amazing. And, and you know, that's grown and evolved. And as you say, it's been organic, mate. And, and that's the journey. And ultimately, now we're a few years down the line and into it. And I think every image on our website, apart from the home image you've took, um, you've done absolutely all of our photography uh, on, on, on the ZA website and the consistency you get in that and the fucking patience you have with us over that is <laughs> astonishing because um, as they say, admin isn't a dirty word, um, but I'm fairly shit at it. Um, so, it's it's there's definitely room for improvement there on my behalf, mate. So we'll send you stuff down sometimes, and you've already fucking got it. Or um, we send you a batch of stuff down, we've missed one out, um, which happens more often or not. But I try and delegate that now to the lads. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's slippery so slippery shoulders, and um, and and I think they're a bit more effective on it than uh, the, 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 than I ever was. So they managed to get you down the Gucci ness. And, uh, and and you turn it into art that we can we can portray to the world, <laughs> yeah. as they say. But yeah, I mean that's that's kind of how we tie in together. 
I think yeah. that's uh, and like now we're just we're just mates, aren't we? We're just, that's like, basically it. Yeah. Yeah. Just you know I mean? ring you up on a Friday and here I am. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, it's eleven forty two AM, um, which means in a little under thirty minutes, me and you are gonna be stood at a bar somewhere in Liverpool, smashing points of Guinness in. Um Sounds and good. we will be there until one of us falls over or falls asleep, I think. I think that's probably gonna be the plan today. Not that uh, we promote alcoholism, but you're looking at two British sailors, yeah? Uh, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> We're black belts in points. That's what we do. Um, that's essentially what uh, what runs the Royal Navy and has done since fucking Lord Nelson ran it with the tots of rum and uh, two tins a day. And I was telling someone the other day about how the fucking beer fridge works in a mess. Three tins a day. Do you know what I mean? Oh, and how you have your little chit and, you know, you just yeah. quit a tin and then you buy, you know, Gucci fucking... And no matter no matter what, everybody has three tins a day, mm. whether they're drinking or not. Mate, 100%. And then, and then it just gets stored everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> if, if What was that fucking film? When we were kids, there was a film and it was about fat kids going to a camp. And I can't remember what the fuck this was, but some of you will know exactly what I'm on about. And it was like a summer camp. And it was, you could tell it was in the 90s. You never get away with making that now. No. Right? But anyway, they'd, they'd lock, you know, lights out overnight. And next thing, the fucking, the knobs would come off the end of the bed and there's fucking Twinkies rolling out, M&Ms <laughs> everywhere, all that type of shit. It's literally the same setup <laughs> on every fucking ship in the Navy. Yeah. If you fart um, or you slam a door, something's going to fall out of the ceiling <laughs> and it will be a tin of Foster's. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's the, or Strongbow. This, or Strongbow. It's fucking everywhere. <laughs> Literally everywhere. And when a ship comes in, I mean, the lads are there with fucking grinders, cutting cutting bits off and putting hinges on stuff so they can stow more beer away. Um, yeah, we can't, we can't give too much of the game away. That makes there maybe some fucking, uh, some officers listening. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, we'll end up getting fucking hung, drawn and quartered by the lads. But it's, uh, yeah, alcoholism in the Royal Navy. It's not a problem. Never has been, never will be. Um, you just, you become beer fit. That's yeah. that's how it works, um, and and that follows you for the rest of your life. I think. Oh yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, <laughs> does, yeah. <laughs> Some of you are listening to this. I've had a point with me as well. So you you, you kind of know um, how frank the tank it gets uh, upon occasion. Um, but yeah, so mate, I mean, ultimately, Rob's is fucking banging. Have you up here, mate? I'm stoked. I'm stoked. You 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 had the time um, available to you in in, in your off time, uh, and you could get up. I think what we're going to do today, mate, is, is bounce around to the workshop after this and take you through some of the motions and how the sausage is made and, and stuff like that. And then, and then ultimately, mate, um, you know, we'll have a pint before we get there, obviously. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll top that off with another pint uh, and then continue into the night with pints and steaks. Um, that's my plan. Um, I look forward to it, mate. Yeah, same. So I think ultimately, mate, that's, that's an opening episode. That's, that's a bit of an introduction. Um, it's, I'm trying to make this um, engaging, I'm trying to make this interesting. There's a lot of formal stuff that goes on in the watch industry where people want to put that professional foot forward. And um, it's great, but there's elements where it becomes fairly sterile yeah. um, and it's corporate and it's this type of thing. Then you have the other end of the spectrum and you've got very much opinion-based stuff and uh, reviews and, and stuff like that. And, and that has this place and I enjoy, I enjoy both sides of that coin. Um, I think what I'm trying to make this into is a bit of a hybrid, something, something in the middle where you can just, see a little bit. Just on. conversations with people that you know. Hey, that's it. Do you yeah. know what I mean? We, fucking hell, mate. Both of us have been lucky over the last four or five years. Um, I, I hate that as well. Let me rephrase that. It's not fucking luck. It's hard work. But over the last four or five years, we've we've put the effort in, mate, and we've managed to stumble across and build and grow relationships with people who are fucking interesting, like turbo interesting. Yeah. And a lot of these people, you only get to hear their story um, if you're in a social environment where they're there. Uh, or there's 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 you know a bar or an event somewhere where there's only a certain amount of tickets, a certain amount of people can come and, and listen to it. I think dragging these people in and and saying, guys, fucking talk to us. You know what I mean? I think that that's a really interesting side of stuff um, that no one gets to hear, and I think that's what I'm trying to achieve with this. So for an opening episode, um, I hope that's more or less set the tone um, of what's going to happen here. Um, me and Rob now are destined for pints. 
um, and a little bit of work and then some more points. So I think we'll probably cap it off, Emmy, if that's fair with you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for joining me on the first one. Uh, <laughs> not that you had much of a fucking choice. It's um, my pleasure, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, until next time, guys. Um, only one bit of advice I got for you. And this is as serious as I could make it. Get your kids into watches. Because if they're into watches, they'll never, ever be able to afford drugs. Have a good day.